August 2025, Morocco. A fossil is lifted from the dust. An armored rib with a one meter long spike fused straight through the bone. Something no scientist has ever seen in any vertebrate, living or extinct. The official story of dinosaur armor just broke. This ancient creature rewrites our understanding of evolution's weirdest defenses, and what comes next will force experts to question how such a monster could have survived at all. Heat rises off the Red Marl as the sun climbs above the Atlas Mountains. The dig team fans out across the outcrop, boots crunching over loose stone. At 28 degrees Celsius, sweat beads on brows by mid-morning, but no one slows down. Susanna Maidment, clipboard in hand, checks the grid while Driss Urhach marks stratigraphic layers. A few meters away, technician El Haji kneels beside a sliver of bone jutting from the sediment. He brushes away dust, revealing a rib thicker than his thumb, with a jagged projection locked to its side. The fragment measures nearly a meter, the spike angled sharply from the shaft. By 10.30 in the morning, the team gathers as El Haji works the rib free, grains of marl falling away to expose the full spike. The shape is unmistakable. This is not a loose armor plate or a skin embedded quill. The spike is fused directly into the rib, continuous from base to tip. Maidment crouches beside the fossil, eyes tracing the seam where bone and spike merge. She does not speak at first. Then, quietly she says, we do not see this in any animal, living or extinct. Silence hangs over the dig as the implications settle in. Every vertebrate known to science, porcupines, stegosaurs, hedgehogs, keeps armor in the skin or atop the skeleton. Here, the spike grows directly from the rib itself, defying every template. Initial measurements confirm the spike's length approaches a full meter, with the rib showing no sign of trauma or post-mortem damage. Maidment stands, brushing dust from her hands. She asks for the field CT scanner. The fossil, still half-wrapped in sediment, is carefully lifted and placed in a padded crate. Uar Haq logs the coordinates, while El Haji photographs the exposed surface. The tension is thick, a mix of disbelief and anticipation. For Maidment, this is the fossil that could rewrite the rules. The rib spike assembly, raw and unstudied, is now in scientific custody. The next step will happen far from the desert heat, but no one at the site will forget the moment the impossible was unearthed. Inside the field tent, the fossil crate rests on a steel table, still wrapped in damp burlap. El Haji steadies the portable computed tomography scanner, his hands practiced and precise. The machine hums to life, its sensor arm circling the rib spike assembly. Within minutes, cross-sectional images appear on the laptop screen. Each slice reveals a continuous bone matrix, no seam, no sign of post-mortem fusion. Trabeculi extend directly from the rib into the base of the spike, their orientation shifting as the spike arches away at a 60-degree angle. The spike is not an afterthought or a patch. It is part of the rib's own architecture, grown in life, locked in death. Maidment leans in, her breath catching as the images resolve. The spike's core shows growth rings and vascular canals, identical to the rib itself. There is no dermal layer, no connective tissue boundary. The scan data settles the question. This is not a case of bone pressed into armor by geological forces. Uh, the spike grew from the rib uh, cell by cell as the animal aged. Uh, for the first time, uh, science holds proof uh, that a dinosaur's armor could be built straight from the skeleton. Uh, chain of custody paperwork is signed as the crate is sealed. Uh, each page stamped by Moroccan authorities uh, and witnessed by university officials. Uh, the registry log records the fossil's ID number, uh, GPS coordinates, uh, and the names of every handler. Uh, no chance for substitution, uh, no gap in the record. Uh, days later, uh, a digital copy of the scan is sent to Nature's editorial board, uh, attached to the manuscript uh, as forensic evidence. Uh, the paper's supplementary files include the scan, uh, the chain of custody forms, uh, and a sworn affidavit from El Haji. Uh, the fossil is declared uh, genuine, uh, anatomically legally and scientifically. In the museum's prep lab, the original rib spike assembly is unpacked under controlled light. 
technicians compare the computed tomography slices uh, to the physical specimen, uh, matching each internal feature to the surface. Uh, the spike's angle, uh, its integration with the rib, uh, and the absence of repair or trauma are all confirmed. Uh, for Maidment and her team, uh, this is more than a discovery. Uh, it is a safeguard uh, against doubt. Uh, the armor of Spicamellus uh, is now a matter of record. Uh, open to scrutiny and impossible to deny. Uh, Finite element analysis begins with a digital replica of the cervical half ring, every spike and vertebral notch mapped from CT data. The modeler's cursor traces the base of the longest spike, 87 centimeters, nearly the length of a baseball bat, before inputting bone density values drawn from histology. When the simulation runs, stress lines ripple across the vertebrae like fault lines on a seismic map. The spikes do not just sit on the surface, they act as levers, multiplying torque every time the animal lowers its head or turns to the side. Results appear in color gradients. Red zones cluster around the spike bases, especially where paired spikes project nearly one meter from the midline. The load is not evenly spread. Instead, each spike acts as a cantilever, pulling against the muscle attachments along the neural spines. Calculations show that to keep the neck stable, Spicamellus needed muscles at least 40% stronger than those of its closest ankylosaur relatives. Without that extra power, the vertebrae would have risked microfracture under even modest movement. The center of gravity becomes the next problem. With so much mass anchored forward, the animal's balance point shifts toward the head. The model shows a marked migration, several centimeters ahead of where it would sit in a typical armored dinosaur. This forward bias means every step, every nod, demanded constant muscular correction. The spikes themselves, rigid and heavy, would have limited rapid movement and made sharp turns risky. Biomechanical outputs suggest a paradox. The neck collar, so spectacular in fossil and in life, creates as many vulnerabilities as protections. The spikes, angled out and slightly forward, would have blocked the animal's own lateral vision and exposed the soft underside of the neck to attack from the side. Stress maps confirm that any lateral blow to a spike could transmit force straight to the vertebrae, risking dislocation or breakage. The engineering verdict is mixed. The collar could be held up, but only at a steep physiological cost. The spikes are not cheap add-ons. They are structural investments, paid for in muscle mass and metabolic demand. The modeler, watching the stress lines flicker across the screen, sums it up with a wry smile. It has all the style of a punk rock jacket, but you would not want to wear it in a bar fight. Layer by layer, Spicamellus reveals a body plan that reads like a catalog of evolutionary improvisation. Along the shoulders, blade-shaped spikes jut outward, each one anchored deep into the bone, forming a serrated barrier above the forelimbs. Moving down the flanks, the armor becomes even more elaborate. The hips carry the longest upward-pointing spikes ever found on any dinosaur, each one a solid shaft of bone angled sharply skyward. Measurements put the largest at over 70 centimeters, a record for upward-facing defense in the fossil record. These hip spikes are not scattered randomly. They form a paired array, each side mirroring the other, creating a formidable barricade against any attack from above. Dorsal plates run in overlapping rows along the spine, some fused into compound shields, others standing alone. The arrangement is less uniform than in later ankylosaurs, with a mosaic of shapes and sizes. The result is a patchwork of protection, each segment tailored to its position on the body. Some plates show growth lines that match seasonal cycles hinting at a life spent constantly reinforcing its defenses. The sheer density and variety of armor suggest an animal encased in its own evolving fortress. Yet the most confounding feature lies at the tail. Here, a series of caudal vertebrae are fused into a rigid handle, thicker and more robust than anything seen in Jurassic dinosaurs. The structure is unmistakable. Vertebrae locked together, forming a bony rod that extends well beyond the hips. But at the end of this handle, the fossil record goes silent. No club has ever been found. No spikes, no blade, no trace of what finished the weapon. 
the evidence stops just short of resolution, leaving only questions. Researchers have mapped out three competing scenarios. A tail club made of keratin that decayed before fossilization. A spike array, reminiscent of a stegosaurus thagomizer, with the fused vertebrae acting as a base for swinging blades. A whip-like tail, the handle serving as a pivot for rapid, flexible strikes. Each hypothesis fits part of the evidence, but none can claim certainty. The tail weapon of Spicamelis remains an unsolved riddle, one that hints at behaviors and threats now lost to time. A modeler in the lab, staring at the digital skeleton, shakes his head in disbelief and says that it is like the animal was armed for a war we cannot reconstruct. He adds that the handle was clearly there, but that we just do not know what it was meant to swing. The arsenal of Spicamelis is complete in every area but one, its final weapon still locked away in the rock or erased by the ages. In the Middle Jurassic, the land now called Morocco sprawled as a vast, shifting floodplain. Shallow rivers braided through silty channels, pooling into oxbows that glimmered under a relentless sun. The air, thick with humidity, carried the scent of ferns and horsetails. Temperatures hovered near 28 degrees Celsius, climbing higher in the dry season, enough to bake the red marl and leave the ground cracked in a patchwork of ochre and gray. Vegetation crowded the water's edge, tall cycades, early conifers, and low mats of club mosses. These plants formed dense thickets along the banks, sheltering insect swarms and small reptiles. Beyond the greenery, the land opened into open woodland and scattered groves, each shaped by the seasonal floods that swept across the plains. The sediment beneath every step told a story of ancient tides, with layers of sand and clay recording each incursion from the shallow sea that sometimes drowned the lowlands. Among this mosaic of habitats, giants moved in an uneasy truce. Spicamelis, armored and low-slung, measured four meters from snout to tail, about the length of a modern car. But it was not the largest animal in its world. Towering above the brush, megalosaurids stalked the floodplain, their muscular legs carrying seven-meter bodies through the shallows. Early Carcharodontosaurs, broad-skulled and sharp-toothed, prowled the margins in search of prey. Even the herbivores were formidable. Stegosaurs like Adraticlet browsed in herds, their plated backs visible above the ferns. The size gap was stark. Where Spicomelis weighed in at an estimated 500 kilograms, the top predators easily doubled or tripled that mass. Teeth recovered from the Elmer's three beds show serrated edges built for slicing through bone and armor alike. Fossilized tracks cross the ancient mud, some pressed deep by the weight of a passing carnivore, others a tangle of smaller prints, evidence of a world where every step could mean the difference between survival and oblivion. The stage was set for a contest not just of tooth and claw, but of adaptation and endurance. A digital model of Spicamelis, armor and all, sits in the lab simulation. The next test is simple in theory. Can this dinosaur's defenses withstand the jaws of its Jurassic rivals? Parameters are set. Estimated bite forces for Middle Jurassic megalosaurids and early Carcharodontosaurs, scaled from fossil skulls and muscle scars, land in the range of several thousand newtons. The simulation begins, virtual teeth bearing down on the armor from above and from the side. Results appear in seconds. The hip spikes, rising sharply upward, absorb the brunt of a top-down attack. Stress maps show the force dispersing through the spike and into the hip bone, well within the safety margin for fossilized bone strength. Only these spikes, the longest ever recorded for upward defense, consistently stop simulated bites cold. But when the force shifts laterally, targeting the neck collar, the story changes. The meter-long neck spikes, so spectacular in profile, fail to deflect a sideways bite. The force travels down the spike and into the neck vertebrae, red zones pooling at the joints. The armor does not shatter, but the vertebrae approach their mechanical limits. In a real attack, a powerful enough predator could have dislocated or even broken the neck. The pattern is clear. Spicamelis is armored for the wrong fight. Its most impressive defenses are angled for aerial or vertical strikes, 
not the lateral ambushes favored by local theropods. The rest of the body, shoulders, flanks, tail, is protected by a patchwork of plates and spikes, but only the hips offer reliable resistance. The neck collar, for all its size, creates blind spots and vulnerabilities. The modeler leans back, half amused. He says, it's like wearing a medieval suit of armor to a pillow fight, overbuilt, overcomplicated, and oddly mismatched to the threats around it. The data leave one conclusion. Spicomelis wasn't just armored, it was over-designed. An evolutionary bomb suit in a world of knives. Under the microscope, a thin slice of neck spike reveals a story written in bone. Each year, new layers accumulate around the core. Broad, uninterrupted bands with no signs of trauma, infection, or rapid repair. Growth rings match seasonal patterns, thickening during periods of abundance and narrowing when resources run thin. This continuous accretion is rare in defensive armor, which usually halts or slows once an animal reaches maturity. Here, the bone keeps building year after year, even as the animal ages. Energy poured into these structures far surpasses what is needed for simple protection. The absence of healed injuries or bite scars rules out a life spent under constant attack. Instead, the evidence points to another force, display. Like antlers or peacock trains, the spikes signal status, costly, conspicuous, and impossible to fake. For Spicamelis, the armor is a billboard, not a shield. A timeline of armored dinosaurs stretches across the Mesozoic, but Spicamelis lands at the very beginning. 165 million years ago, it is the oldest named ankylosaur on record. Its discovery in Morocco creates a continental puzzle piece where none existed before. While most ankylosaur fossils come from North America, Asia, and Europe, Spicamelis stands alone in Africa, predating its nearest relatives by at least 15 million years. This sudden appearance points to a ghost lineage, an entire southern branch of armored dinosaurs hidden by gaps in the fossil record. On a map of Jurassic Gondwana, the Moroccan find redraws migration routes and evolutionary trees. Armor complexity peaks early with Spicamelis, then declines as later species streamline their defenses. The rulebook does not run from simple to complex. Here, the story runs in reverse, shaped by continents in motion and mysteries still buried beneath ancient stone. Today, scientists still unearth new Spicamelis armor from Moroccan rock. Each fossil challenges our idea of how and why life evolves to extremes. In a world where nature's experiments are vanishing faster than we can study them, this ancient anomaly reminds us that evolution's wildest designs can vanish overnight. What other impossible creatures lie waiting beneath our feet?